My friend, that is how miracles happen in the church, you know, in, in its uh, beginning, in its early years, in its early days, and that's why and how miracles happen today. It's through believing the gospel message. It's not through our good works. It's not because, you know, I, I've spent an, an hour praying every day, and that's really helpful. It's not because I spent a half an hour every day reading my Bible, and that's really helpful. It's not because I, I haven't kicked the dog or said anything unkind to anyone. It's not because I've kept the law. It's not because of my track record, not because of my behavior, but because of my faith. And obviously and certainly when we embrace Christ, it affects our behavior. It changes us from the inside out. The law tries to, to mold us from the outside in. Grace changes us from the inside out. And it's through believing the gospel message that miracles and that healings occur, not through good works, not through keeping the law. Welkom bij Antwoorden met Belis Kanli. God ziet je. Hij houdt van je. En wat er ook aan de hand is, Hij heeft de antwoorden op je vragen. We, we began last time, if you were with us for the last broadcast, uh, we're looking at questions that are posed in the scripture by God, by the Lord Jesus Christ, sometimes by a prophet, sometimes just by an individual, but questions that have to do with the subject of healing. And today we're going to begin in the book of Acts in chapter 4. There was a man that was paralyzed from his mother's womb. He'd never walked, and he was healed. And it got everybody's attention. The, the religious leaders, it got their attention. The church was rejoicing. The man himself was walking and leaping and praising God. And uh, Peter and John got called on the carpet before the religious leaders. And this is the question that's asked in Acts chapter 4 and verse 7. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? I mean, was this the, the power of mind over matter? No, it was the power of Christ over disease. And in verse 10, Peter gives a very straightforward answer. He says, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. It's by the name of Jesus and through faith in that name That, that he was healed. And friend, the name of Christ has been given to his church. Jesus said, if you read in, in the gospel of Mark in the last chapter there, he said, you know, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. You know, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that believes not will be damned or condemned. And these signs will follow them that believe in my name, in my name, that is in the name of Jesus, they will cast out demons. In my name, they will lay hands on the sick they will recover. Literally, it says they will drive away serpents. If they drink anything deadly, it shall not harm them. Friend, that's a good promise when you're out on the mission field, when you're obeying Jesus and taking the gospel to the four corners of the world. I remember being in some mountain villages somewhere and having to eat some things that were set before me that I would not have wanted to eat. In fact, one time I, I was given some things to eat and drink in a little Indian village in, in some mountains, you know, in, in the interior of Mexico. I've been preaching the gospel there, and I had a gentleman with me from Mexico City, and he wouldn't eat the food or drink, and he just leaned over and says, Bayless, don't. He said, it'll make you sick. And I, I listened to what he said, and then I looked at my host. He was the actual head tribesman of the village there, and I just preached the gospel to them, just preached about a miracle Uh, working Jesus, and the smile on his face because of what they'd prepared for me. But here my friend, you know, from the, the, the capital city there said, look, if you eat that, you'll get violently sick. He says, I won't drink it. I won't eat it myself. And I looked and I said, I thought to myself, I'm not going to offend my host. The scripture says to eat what's set before you, asking no question for conscience sake. And, uh, You know, Jesus said, if you drink any deadly thing, it will not harm you. That, that was the, when you go out and preach the gospel is the context. So it, it was the perfect context. So I smiled and I thanked my host and I took a big bite and I grabbed the cup and I took, took a big squig. I drank it all. I ate it all and I never got sick. God protected me. 
but it's in the name of Jesus that these things happen. Peter said, hey, you want to know by, by what power, by what name this has been done? And this is, this is through Jesus Christ. He was and he is a healer. We come to another question, Galatians chapter 3, verse 5. And I want to read this to you from James Moffat's translation. I, it just, it struck me. I, I like the way that he worded it. James, or Galatians 3 and 5, and, and again, there's a question here. It says, when he, that is when God, when he supplies you with a spirit and works miracles among you, is it because you do what the law commands or because you believe the gospel message? All right, when God works miracles among you, when he supplies you with his spirit, when people are filled with the spirit, is it because you've kept the law or is it because you believe the gospel message? Is it because of your works, because of your track record, or is it because of faith? And the answer came in verse six. He says, why? It's as with Abraham, he had faith in God. My friend, that is how miracles happen in the church, you know, in in its uh, beginning, in its early years, in its early days, and that's why and how miracles happen today. It's through believing the gospel message. It's not through our good works. It's not because, you know, I've spent an an hour praying every day, and that's really helpful. It's not because I spent a half an hour every day reading my Bible, and that's really helpful. It's not because I I haven't kicked the dog or said anything unkind to anyone. It's not because I've kept the law. It's not because of my track record, not because of my behavior, but because of my faith. And obviously and certainly when we embrace Christ, it affects our behavior. It changes us from the inside out. The law tries to, to mold us from the outside in. Grace changes us from the inside out. And it's through believing the gospel message that miracles and that healings occur, not through good works, not through keeping the law. In his answer, you know, Paul writing to the Galatians said, man, it's it's as it was with Abraham, he had faith in God. Well, how was it with Abraham? Let me read to you from Romans chapter 4 and verse 17. It says, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. Now, that is what God said to Abram was his name. I have made you the father of many nations. And God changed his name from Abram, which means father of height or father of altitude, to Abraham, which means father of nations. And God changed Sarai's name um, to Sarah. And Sarah means young princess. And so God said, all right, from now on, Abram, father of height, father of altitude, you are now father of a multitude. And now your wife's name is young princess. Now there are up in age, like like 190 or whatever. And she's past the age of childbearing. She's been barren her whole life. Physical impossibility for them to have kids. And God here says, I have made you. Not I'm going to make you. I have made you. God put it in the past tense. And when God changed their names and said, now you call yourself by this name, Abraham. And Sarah, you call yourself by this name. God put things in the past tense when he made the promise, and by, you know, changing their names, he authorized them to do the same thing. Every time Abraham said his name, every time he called his wife's name Sarah, he was calling things that were not as though they were. He was putting it in the past tense as if it had already happened. And friend, faith does that. You know, faith connects with God, but there there has to be a point when it's put in the past tense. Not just after, after it becomes a physical reality, but you you've received it in your heart, you've counted as done. Jesus said this, Mark 11, 24, says, What things, whoever you desire, when you pray, believe that you have received them, and you will have them. So I have to believe that I have received it, and then I will have it. I don't have to have it and then believe I received it. That's backwards. I have to believe I've received it. I've received it in my heart. God has sent the answer. You know, the, 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 the Amplified Bible says something along the lines of believe that it has been granted to you and you'll get it. So if I believe that it's been granted to me, I'm going to thank God. God, I thank you that I have this. I thank you that it's done. How somebody may walk up and say, what are you talking about? You know, you're still bent over. You're, you're, you still, I can see you don't have that. Why are you saying you have that? Well, Abraham was saying, I'm a father of a multitude. Well, Abraham, where's the multitude? You, you're saying Sarah's a young princess. Hey, she's an old woman. 
What, what are you doing? I can tell she's not young. I can tell you don't have kids. What are you saying? Abraham said, look, you know, God said it. God put it in the past tense. I'm doing the same thing. And we need to, faith does the same thing. Again, the question to the Galatians, Paul said, hey, you know, God supplies you the spirit. He works miracles among you. How does he do it? Is it because you keep the law or because you believe the gospel message? It says with Abraham, he had faith in God. And, and we're reading here from Romans chapter 4 about Abraham. And it says that as it is written, this is God speaking, I made you the father of many nations, in the presence of him whom he believed, all right? In the presence of God, Abraham believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. And when God calls something that doesn't exist as though it did, when God puts it in the past tense, he authorizes you to do the same thing, and faith does the same thing goes on, talks about Abraham, who contrary to hope, talking about human hope, he in, in hope believed, he believed in supernatural hope, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And it goes on, says, in not being weak in faith, he didn't consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old. One translation says he already had one foot in the grave, and already dead. It says, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, so her womb was dead. When he's calling her a young princess, he's got one foot in the grave, so to speak. He's 100 years old, and this thing's not going to happen. But he believed according to what was spoken. It goes on, he didn't waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. The, the Living Bible says he praised God for this blessing even before it happened. That's the same way that miracles occur in the church today, my friend, is by believing according to what God has stated, not according to how things look or how we feel. Miracles in the church today happen the same way. They'll happen for you and they'll happen for me the same way by believing the word that has been preached, not because I've earned it by the time that I've spent in prayer or I've passed out so many gospel tracts today or you know, I, I've towed the line, and I've not said anything wrong, and I've, I, I've, I've guarded my mind, you know, against dwelling on it. Those things are important. Certainly, our behavior and our thinking are important. Our words are important. You know, kindness is important. Obeying the scriptures, incredibly important. But it's because of faith that God works miracles and supplies the Spirit today. All right, we're going to move on. I got a lot more I could say about that, but I got a lot more questions too. Here's another one. This is from Matthew chapter 9. Interesting. In Matthew 9, verse 27, Jesus is speaking. Well, the story is self explanatory. He says, When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. Now, I just want to stop right there. Two blind men followed him. You know, it's not easy for a blind person to follow someone. And it's interesting, you will find that many of the stories where people were healed in the Bible, they sought Jesus out, they came. The, the woman with the issue of blood, she came in the press behind and grabbed the hem of Jesus' garment. Jairus came to Jesus and fell at his feet, you know, on behalf of his little daughter that lay at home dying. You know, again and again, the Roman centurion, you know, sent the elders of the Jews to find Jesus. That There was action on their part. That They were proactive. They went after him. It wasn't, well, God knows where I live. And if he wants me to have this, you know, he'll do it. And if he doesn't, he won't. No, you, you don't read about any stories like that in the Gospels. And here are the two blind men, they follow Jesus, and they're crying out, Son of David, have mercy on us. Verse 28, when he'd come into the house, the blind men came to him. Amazing. Since then Jesus said to them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said to him, yes, Lord. And he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were open, and Jesus sternly warned them, seeing that, see that no one knows, knows it or knows about it. Um, but it says, when they departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. And, and because of those kind of things, he wasn't able to travel about freely like he wanted to do. They didn't do what he said to do after they were healed. But he said, according to your faith. Well, their faith was demonstrated by searching him out and coming after him. And Jesus asked them the question, do you believe I'm able to do this? 
that's important. But it's, it's not the entirety of the equation. Now, most people, saint and sinner alike, if you ask them the question, do you believe God is able? Do you believe God could heal this cancer? Do you believe that God could open these blind eyes? Do you believe that God could uh, provide work for you? Do you believe that God could turn the tables in your favor so that the situation that you're currently in shifts? Do you believe God could take that arthritis out of your body? Well, certainly, yes, Lord. That's how they answer. All right? It's good to have that. It's good to be able to answer resounding yes. In fact, you might, might even say right now, yes, Lord, I believe you are able. I believe you can, which brings us to another question that is very important as well. It's also in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 8 and verse 1. So we go back one chapter. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, it says, When he'd come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Again, that's just an important thing to realize that people followed him. They went after him. It says, And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, there is a question embedded in his statement. He knew the Lord was able. He said, you can make me clean. Lord, I know you're able to do this if you are willing. So the question that's embedded here, Lord, are you willing? I'm not sure you're willing. I know you can. I know you're able. But are you willing to do this? And that's where a lot of people tend to stumble. They know God can. Certainly, you know, God. we all know God's able. There's nothing he can't do. I mean, he is God. But the question is, Lord, are you willing? I know you can heal me, but do you want to? Is it your will? That's where a lot of people stumble. Then Jesus put out his hand, verse 3, and touched him, saying, I am willing to be cleansed. It is my will. Immediately, immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Now, it's important to be able to answer that. God showed his willingness to heal us by sending his son Jesus and by Jesus taking the stripes on his back. Think about this. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Without the shedding of blood, there's no, um, there's no, no atonement. There's no remission for sins. So Christ came and he died and shed his blood. That atoned for our sins. He paid the price through his death. There, there's no theologian, you know, virtually in any denomination or movement that, that's going to argue with that. The price of sin was paid through the death of Christ and only through the death of Christ, through the shedding of his precious, priceless blood. If that's true, then Jesus could have died a relatively painless, quick death and shed his blood and paid for our sins. Why then did the Father allow him to suffer so? Why did he wear the crown of thorns on his head? Why was his back laid open with that Roman whip? And if you do a little studying, you find out that a Roman cat of nine tails, the kind of whips that they used, had little beads of lead or pieces of bone, you know, sewn into the end of them, and it literally tore pieces of flesh off. Now, under the Jewish law, one of the punishments was 39, 40 stripes, save one, 39 stripes. Some people say, well, Jesus, you know, was whipped 39 times. Actually, you know, the Jews weren't the ones that whipped Jesus. The Romans had no such law, and their whips were quite different. There, there's no indication, nothing in the scriptures that say they stopped at 39. Most people never lived through a Roman scourging. Read in Fox's Book of Martyrs, and it talks about, you know, people's backs that were laid open, their muscles were laid bare, their bones were laid bare. You could see their organs. Like, like I said, most people never lived through it because when they would whip them, the, 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 the beads of, of, of lead or the, the bone would go into the skin, and when they pull it, would rip chunks of flesh off. And Jesus' back was laid open. And the scripture says, by his stripes you were healed. 1 Peter 2, 24, whose own self bore our sins in his own body, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Again, it's in the past tense. And I was reading um, a, a, a Greek scholar the other day, actually it was, was some a few years ago, really. It's been a while since I picked it up, but I was thinking about it the other day. And uh, he said that actually the word stripes there, it's stripe singular. He said the Greek demand, this is what he said, the Greek demands 
that if you could have even told, you know, discern one stripe from another, it would have had to be, according to the Greek language, stripes, plural. But Jesus' back was just one bleeding mass, just a gaping wound. It was, it was one. He had been, there, there was no flesh left on his back. There weren't individual stripes that you could see. His back was completely ripped off. Therefore, in the Greek language, it's by his stripe. You were healed, putting in the past tense. And again, Peter there, he's looking to the finished works as it's done. By his stripes, you were healed. But the prophecy looking forward to that is found in um, Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. And let me read it to you. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, it says, Surely, and that, by the way, means just what it says, Surely, absolutely, beyond argument, beyond all doubt, Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. The word there for grief, it's the same word translated as sickness and disease throughout the Old Testament. Grief is included in the word, but it's the weakest meaning of the word. Literally, surely he has borne our sicknesses and carried our sorrows. That word is also translated as physical pain elsewhere in the scriptures and in particular in the book of Job. Surely he, speaking of Jesus prophetically, Beyond all doubt, beyond, beyond all argument, surely he has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. The punishment that Jesus took and the question, why didn't Jesus just, just die a relatively quick and pain, painless death? and pay for our sins, why did God allow him to suffer so? It's because by his stripes we're healed. He wore the crown of thorns on his head so that we could have peace. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. His brow had the crown of thorns and he was beaten repeatedly, struck in the face. If you, you look at the story and his suffering and persecution up to the time when he was nailed to that rough beam of wood, why did all that happen? Why did the father allow that? That was for your physical healing. That was for your peace. His death paid and took care of the sin problem. The, the laceration on his back, the tearing away of his flesh, that provided healing. And you know, in Matthew chapter 8, it actually quotes these verses. This is a Holy Spirit commentary on Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. It says here, Matthew 8, 16, When the evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Now here Jesus is healing people based on the atonement yet future. We now can receive healing based on the atonement past. Again, 1 Peter 2.24, that by his stripes you were healed. Now, my point in all this, we're talking about God's willingness God, are you willing to heal? Well, think about what he allowed his son to go through. He, 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 he wrote, I am willing, and he wrote it in blood across the back of his son. I remember one of the, in fact, it was the first time that I traveled overseas. I took my wife with me. I'd been invited to speak in a, a large conference overseas, hadn't been overseas before. I had to get a passport. I had, we had to get visas. We both had to get passports, had to get visas. He had to arrange the air travel. We had to get babysitters to take care of our young children. We, we've spent much, you know, effort. And, and when I get back, I'm going to have to double up on work, you know, to, to catch up on things when we get back. And if I would have gotten there after all that, and people said, well, you know, Bayless, are you really willing to minister to us? I was like, what? What are you saying? Do you, do you realize that... that you know, we've, we've gotten babysitters to watch our kids for nine days or eight days. And we went through the process of getting visas and, and our passports and arranging all the air travel and, and arranging people to come speak for us and doubling up on my work before. Yeah, of course we're willing. I mean, doesn't that prove that we're willing? Well, my friend, Jesus left the glory world and came to this world to prove that God loves you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. He allowed his son to, to be whipped beyond beaten, beyond recognition, to provide peace and healing for you. Yes, he 
is willing. He loves you. And if you've never embraced Jesus before, I just want to tell you, you know, he won't turn you away if you will come to him. You are loved by God. And listen, if you support this broadcast, I just want to say thank you. You know, through your, your faithful support, we're able to take this and put it in multiple languages and send it around the world, literally into some 100 and different, 120 different countries. We, we just want Jesus to be glorified. We want his word to go out and we want to encourage as many people as we can. So until next time, and I'll be picking up this up again, God richly bless you in Jesus' name. You know, there are certain things that the scriptures specifically tell us that they are God's will for us to have. And yet, it's very clear from the Bible that if we don't go after them and pursue them, we won't experience them. So I have written a book on that subject dealing with the things that we should pursue in our lives, the things that God deems as important that he wants us to have, yet we won't experience them if we don't go after them. Bestel het boek Streven naar wat er echt toe doet. Online via beles-condi.nl of bel 085-009-0369.